Good morning, everyone. There we go. Let me hear it one more time. Good morning, brothers and sisters. God bless you all. Today is a good day. It is a day the Lord has made. We are going to rejoice and be glad in it. Be glad in it. Hallelujah. We want to welcome all of you here, welcome all of you at home. We know, uh, you know, uh, it's still a little thin, but we want to continue to welcome those that, as, as they come in uh, this evening. We're just going to get started. But we just serve an awesome and mighty God, and we are blessed to have some amazing young ladies lead us in worship this morning. This is Liberty, Sophia, and Faith, and they are here to bless us. They've actually been here before one of our, uh, a couple of our harvest parties, hasn't it? Mm -hmm. And they are just gifted by God with beautiful voices and really have a grace to lead people into worship. And so they have blessed us with God's presence this morning, and they are going to lead us in an awesome way. But I just have a couple announcements before we get started, and we will... We will get going. <clears throat> this is Mission Sunday, uh, so please prayerfully consider giving to the missions fund. That is $3,600 under missions, uh, under our Tidely app. Um, we have an opportunity to serve some kids in Springfield Junior High. A program has reached out to us to be mentors. All of you who have emails should have received one. You can contact the office, and we can go from there. If that is something you are interested in doing, touching these young junior high kids and loving on them and mentoring them. We have our first outdoor service the last Sunday of June. Now, there should be some crazy clapping going on right now because we love our outdoor services. All you wild animals out there. We are excited, but we are also, just, just stay tuned because we are having a potluck, okay? And it's been a while since we had a potluck, but we know God uh, uh, is going to be there. We're going to be there, and we're going to be hungry afterwards, and we're just going to fellowship and have a good time after an awesome, good weather outdoor service we declare in the name of Jesus. So let's just prepare our hearts for worship. Heavenly Father, we come before you. We come before you in adoration. We come before you with expectation. We come before you humbly, ready to serve and minister unto you this morning. Father, I thank you for every heart here prepared with soft soil, supple soil in their hearts to receive what you have uh, uh, ready to give today. Today is the day of salvation, completeness, wholeness, and healing. I pray for the broken to be mended, the confused to see clear, the bitter to become soft, Lord God. Lord, do your thing this morning as we minister unto you. We just thank you for everything. We give you all the glory all the honor and praise in the mighty name of Jesus Christ and all of his saints said, amen. Let's give God the glory and praise and worship this morning.
that is who you are. You are the way, the truth, and the life. You are the living God. You are the bread of life. You are living water. Thank you, Lord, every day for reminding us who you are, Lord God. Thank you for reminding us who we are in you, Lord God, that we are children of God, the Most High. What a blessing and an honor it is to be children of God. He is worthy to be praised. At this time, we have a word of knowledge. Praise the Lord. The Lord showed me um, Jesus standing in the ocean in water that was choppy and just uh, roiling back and forth. And he just stood there solid. The waves weren't affecting him, and he had his arms out like this. And there's some one or, or more than one person that feels that they're in the struggling in the waves and trying to get uh, to a place of safety and the Lord standing there with his arms out but he was smiling and he was confident and he was calm and he was just beckoning you to come to him and come into him and he will embrace you and keep you from the turmoil you will find peace in him as you come close to him draw closer and closer and as he's not paying attention to the waves around him and the choppy water as you're drawing closer and closer to him you will not either you will be immersed into him and and embrace that smile that calmness that confidence that he has over the circumstances amen amen thank you bunny he will lead us beside still waters you are a shepherd you know exactly what we need and when we need it Let's just give God a round of applause this morning. I'd also like to thank Liberty, Sophia, and Faith. Thank you, ladies, for leading us into worship. Just amazing, absolutely amazing. We always love to see a younger generation on fire for the Lord. It's encouraging to us all that we see younger men and women rising up. Des not desperate, but desiring to be in the presence of God, desiring to lead us into the throne room of his grace. Hallelujah. We're just going to get ready to release our wonderful children. Children, we just thank you. Well, Lord, we thank you for our children. Lord, we thank you for the plans you have for them. We thank you for the plans in place by the Holy Spirit to lead, guide, and direct them. We thank you for the teachers that pray over our children, that pray over the lessons we thank you, Holy Spirit, for continuing to have your way as you raise up another awesome generation, hungry and passionate for our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. You are released. Amen. My dad's going to bless us with another word. Amen. You know, I just want to say for my father that, you know, this guy, he is just as busy for the Lord as he was 40 years ago. I mean, he is going, going, going for God's kingdom on this earth. And so it's just a blessing to see him up here, passionate to study, passionate to feed, passionate just to serve the Lord also in this capacity. So, Father, thank Amen. you. Amen. God bless you. Amen. Good morning, church. We're going to continue on what I was sharing last week, discovering your I am or our I am. Before I do that, I just want to mention because here we don't run things Holy Spirit does that. And I want to encourage this morning, we had one word of knowledge here, but if the Lord reveals something to you as you sit there, a word of knowledge, a word of wisdom, a prophetic word, something about healing or whatever, um, write that down, and when I'm finishing the word, we want to give time for that, and we'll go back in another song of worship. So I just want to encourage all of you, uh, always be attentive and open to Holy Spirit. I think so often we come and we just get comfortable sitting back and sitting down rather than standing up in the Spirit of God. So I encourage us to do that. I want to continue this morning talking about discovering your I am. But this part I'm going to focus more on decoding your spiritual DNA. This is so important in understanding and becoming all that God's called you to be. Last week I used the example in talking about this, 
so that you'd understand. What do you mean when you talk about I am? Say I am. I am. That means I exist. I'm present. I'm here. I'm now. I'm in the fray. I'm in the battle. Whatever. I am. And the importance of that. And so last week I shared a little bit about Moses and the burning bush and God sending him to the children of Israel. And he says, tell them I am who I am has sent you and this will be my name throughout eternity. Last week I talked about Jesus in John 8, 58, who said before Moses was, I am. And I looked at seven different aspects of how he talked about I am the way, the truth and the life and the, and the different things, the bread of life and all those things. But just as Father Abba is I am, and Jesus is I am, I want us to personalize it in order to understand and be effective for the Lord in understanding our I am. Ron, where do you get off on that? Where did, tell me where that comes from. Paul made it very personal to you and I. He said in 1 Corinthians 15, 10, I am who I am by the grace of God. Say, I am. I am. You are who you are by the grace of God if you are in Christ. Now, the importance of this, because so many people don't know. As a matter of fact, many times when I'm doing workshops and seminars, I'll talk about how that a, an unbeliever uh, who was a psychiatrist and author and uh, many, and all this type of stuff years ago said that 94% of people live and die and never know their purpose. And as I've shared over and over again, that is the greatest identity theft in the world. Satan wants to steal your identity. He wants to steal your understanding of your why, why you exist, your purpose. He wants to steal your sense of destiny. And so what he gets us to focus on is our destination. Well, I'm going to heaven, destination, instead of our destiny. Because our destiny is about bringing heaven to earth. And that's why Jesus told us to pray that way. A question for us this morning. If you had the power to become, to be anyone you wanted to be, who would that be? Who would that be? I dare say many of us who are in Christ would say, well, I want to be just like Jesus. Romans 8, 29 says we're going to be conformed to his image. But let me tell you about that just a moment. That, that doesn't involve me, just me as an individual. I have an individual part of that as a member of his body, but it's his body, the corporate body, that is the fullness of Christ, Ephesians 1.23. And so the illustration I've used over and over again, the pen, and I'm going to use it over and over again. We, we've talked about this. We know what it is. It's everybody, boy, point pen. Why? Its identity is determined by its purpose, its design, what it was created for. And we know that it was created or made for its personal, individual purpose, writing. But its overall purpose is communication. And so what I try to bring across to every believer is our overarching purpose in Christ is advancing his kingdom on earth as it is in heaven. Can I get an amen? amen. But what's your individual part in that? Communication, but here's something, it's individual part in communication and fulfilling that is writing. What's your personal, individual, I am? Paul knew who he was. He said, I am. What I am, who I am, by the grace of God. And he said he wouldn't let that grace go with no effect. He was going to make sure it was fulfilled. So I talked to you last week about becoming the best you. That's who you should desire to be. Because if you become the best you in Christ, as I said last week, your greatest gift you can give to God is you. But your best you. See, God doesn't accept an unacceptable sacrifice, a lame sacrifice. So our goal is becoming the best us. And so I said what that involves is knowing who you are, accepting who you are, and being who you are. Because as we said last week, so many people 
wanted to be like somebody else. How many can honestly say you, at some point in your life you just looked at, but I'd like to be like that. Some of you might want to be a golfer, Tiger Woods or some golfer or whatever. No, be yourself. Be yourself. Get real. Because being yourself, you'll be the best gift God wants because he created you for a specific purpose. Now, the reason we need to share some of these things because we've been discipling over all the years, 50-some years. But what I love seeing is more generations coming in. And so those of us who've been around for quite a while can help those who are starting out because so many people in life, not just younger people, older people as well, don't know their I am. And so I want to talk about that this morning. A couple weeks ago, as I was in New York doing a workshop on teamology, a business owner came up to me afterwards because I was talking about the necessity of team for success in today's field of market. And of course, God is the, we got a problem here? God is the source or origin of team. And with that, the Godhead, Father, Son, and Holy Spirit. So with that, if we have perfect team and understand team, we're going to be far more successful. Now, and he came up to me and he said, uh, Ron, he said, give to me the definition of success. And I said to him, we really need to find success. Success to so many people today is fortune, fame, material things. Whether you're older or younger, young people growing up, whatever, want things. And looking for that. We have to redefine success. You see, when Jesus was hanging on the cross, his mother, his brothers, all those, none of them saw it as success, did they? But Jesus came to destroy the works of the devil. He came to seek and save the lost. He came to re-inaugurate the kingdom of God on earth as it is in heaven. That's full. As a matter of fact, Jesus is perfect theology. Perfect theology. He was so successful, you know, that what he was able to say on the cross was, it is finished. I've been successful. Now, the word success literally means to achieve your aim or purpose. So think about success in that way, to achieve your aim or purpose. Now, again, let's look at Jesus. Jesus is ministering. We see the story in John chapter 4. And after he's ministering, his disciples have gone off to the city. They come back, and they, they said, uh, well, uh, 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 we need to get him something to eat. We need, Jesus, did you eat? Look, guys, I don't need any food. He said, my food is to do the will of my Father and to finish the work. That's success. Paul said he had fought the fight of faith. At the end of our life, what will we say? That has a lot to do with what we do today. So we look at Jesus, and he speaks of that in John 4, 34. My, will is to, or my meat is to do the will of him who sent me and to finish the work. So success is fulfilling your purpose, your I am, to know who you are, to accept who you are, to be who you are, and that is so key. Let me redefine those three, know who you are. Know who you are. That means discovering your real purpose. What you individually have been created by God chosen before the foundation of the world to be and to do in his kingdom. I share with you, I, 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 I feel fulfilled. I, I know what God's called me to do. Paul, Paul knew, he said in 2 Timothy 1.11, I've been called, appointed by God, chosen, graced by God to be a preacher, an apostle, and a teacher. He could come to the end of his life and say, I'm ready to be poured out like a drink offering. I fought the fight. I've done what God's called me to do. Young people, do you know what God's called you to do? Because we're going to go on a journey of discovery, helping you discover what God's called you to do. 
I mean, it's called unique. So knowing is all about discovering your purpose, your why in life. God, yeah, I know I'm here to advance your kingdom, but what's my particular part in that? And we have to decode our DNA that will help us in understanding that. Secondly, accepting who you are, accepting your purpose. How many of you have ever heard something from God, but you say, um, no, I don't? I don't think so. I'll tell you what, God, I'll fill out a piece of paper and hand it to you, and you sign it and bless me. And God says, no, you give me a blank piece of paper with your signature on it, and I'll fill it out. <laughs> so accepting your purpose. And thirdly, being who you are. That is fulfilling, finding, and, but, but fulfilling your purpose. So this morning, I want you to turn with me to Romans chapter 12. Romans chapter 12. And this morning, I'm going to be reading out of the, out of the uh, Passion Bible. I've been having a blast in this. I love getting different translations and starting all over, marketing them up and everything. It's just fun. So I want you to go with me to Romans chapter 12. Because we're going to look at this. And when I'm talking about decoding your DNA, I, I wrote this down because I'm not a scientist. DNA, complex molecule that contains all the information. Say all the information. Within our cells that build and maintain the organism or life. So your DNA, everything's in there. It's like I talked before. In discovering your identity, it's like the prego spaghetti sauce. Everything's in there. If you remember the commercial, everything's in there. And so understanding that, that we have the spiritual DNA, what happens when we're born again? When we're born again? When we're born again? Our spiritual DNA is resurrected. See, God said in the garden, if you disobey me, surely you will die. But when Holy Spirit came in, it resurrected our spiritual DNA. Our DNA changed addresses, as I like to say. We are a new creation. Turn to somebody and say, you're a new creation. The importance of understanding and that's, that, that's what happens when we're born again. Now, an important property of DNA is its ability to replicate itself. That is, copies of itself. And so we have in families the DNA passed into our offspring down on through. And you can go on uh, different websites and, and, and check your DNA and find your ancestry all the way back through. Why? It's been passed on down. It can replicate. It can copy itself. Jesus said, Jesus said in 1 John 4, verse 17, the latter part of the verse, well, actually, John speaking, but by the Holy Spirit, speaking of Jesus, as he is, so are we in this world. When? Later on? Now. Now. I want to read before I go into uh, something here, before I go into 1 Corinthians 12 and start there, I want to read from Hebrews something here about Jesus. Speaking of Jesus, the sun is the dazzling radiance of God's splendor, the exact expression of God's true nature. That literally means the exact copy, the exact expression of God's true nature, his mirror image. He holds the universe together and expands it by the mighty power of his spoken word. He accomplished for us the complete cleansing of sins and then took his seat on the highest throne at the right hand of the majestic one. Jesus is the exact representation. He's perfect theology. If you've seen me, he said, you've seen the Father. And so I want now to go to Romans chapter 12, and I want to begin here in looking at this as to how we begin to walk this through. Now, let me ask you a question. Those of you who've been with us, because we say it over and over again, and we'll continue to say it over and over again, know that we're heavy on discipleship. It's like I say all the time. Churches are full of believers, but they're not full of disciples. All disciples are believers, but all believers aren't disciples. Okay? That's out of the way. And so here, we're very strong on our discipleship, and we have three C's of discipleship. Can anybody tell me what the first one is? Commitment. Commitment. Commitment is a choice. And we're going to look at that here. The second one, what's the second C? Character. Commitment, character. And what's the third 
C. Calling, well done, thou good and faithful servants. Commitment, character, and calling, the three C's of our discipleship. Now, under calling, we have three D's. To discover your calling, your I am, your individual purpose, we have three D's. What's the first one? Discover. Discover. What's the second one? Come on. Develop. So you discover your grace and your gifts, you develop them, and then you are deployed. Deploy, discover, develop, deploy. See, here we don't teach employment. We teach deployment. God's your provider wherever you work. He's your provider. Your job isn't your provider. The Bible says God's our provider. He uses different things like that. And like I say over and over again, imagine the sanctified genius of the Lord who, who puts us in a workplace where we have people who don't even know Jesus supporting us on our mission field. We're all called full-time. So we see, discover, develop, and deploy. So now I want to start in Romans chapter 12 here because I'm going to bring these principles out. Romans chapter 12, verse 1, Paul begins saying, Beloved friends, what should be our proper response to God's marvelous mercies? Now let me say from other translations, he says, I beseech you. I beseech you. And that word in the Greek literally means there's a pleading here that's going on. I want you to understand what is about to continue here. The Lord, through Holy Spirit, speaking through Paul, is pleading with his church to get this. So important. And he goes on to say this. Beloved friends, what should God's marvelous mercies, uh, 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 because God's marvelous mercies, to surrender yourselves to God to be his sacred living sacrifices and live in holiness, experiencing all that delights his heart, for this becomes your genuine expression. Key number one is commitment to discovering and knowing your I am. Commitment. I want to talk about commitment. Now, let's drop down to verse 6 just for a minute, and then I'm going to come back up. Verse 6, he says this. Let me find it here. Verse 6. God's marvelous grace, say grace, grace, imparts to each one of us, say each one of us, of his varying gifts, or as some having gifts then differing according to the grace of God, as some translations say. I want every one of you to realize this this morning. Every one of us, if we're born of his spirit and have his spirit, have received gifts from the Father. Every one of us. Every one of us. It leaves nobody out. Do you know those gifts? How do I discover those things? And that's what we want to go on a journey on and helping each and every one to understand why is that so important? Imagine somebody you love very much, very, very much. And you had a very valuable, valuable gift all wrapped up for them. And you give it to them. And they don't even open it. Not only that, they put it in a closet. How would you feel? How does Abba feel? Father, who's given every one of us gifts. Are we unwrapping those gifts? Do we understand what they are? And so he says, everyone's received them. So we come back up to verse 1, and we see how the view of his mercy let us offer ourselves as living sacrifices. This whole idea of commitment, the importance of that. Some of you in your breakfast this morning may have had ham and eggs. Two different creatures committed to your breakfast. One gave far greater commitment than the other. (laughs) Commitment. Offering ourselves as a living sacrifice. Another word for commitment or surrender that he uses here. In other words, you'll never discover your I am who you really are until you're willing to surrender all to the Lord. 
Commitment. Another word for commitment is covenant. And this is something so underpreached and so misunderstood in the body of Christ. But you'll never fully grasp the level of Abba's love unless you understand covenant because his nature is covenant. And so the prophet Malachi says, why do you break faith with one another by profaning the covenant of our fathers by breaking faith with one another? We see marriage as an example of covenant. I say it over and over again. We walk down the aisle, you and your spouse say, I do and had no idea what you did until you began living life together. Is, am I right? What you agree to do, what covenant does, it commits to living life together. Commitment to the Lord is a choice. It all begins there. As a matter of fact, the Hebrew word for covenant, berith, literally means to cut in two or divide. And the Greek word diatheke, diathru, and theke, a repository for dead bodies. So it speaks of a death. And so Paul says, have a full view of God's mercy. Lamentations. 3, 22 and 23 says, God's mercies are new when? Amen. Having full view of his mercy. Offer yourself as a living sacrifice. Oxymoron. Sacrifice is dead, but he says a living sacrifice. We won't get into it, but in the Old Testament, they use flesh hooks to keep the sacrifice on the altar. That's an interesting concept. So offering ourselves, having this commitment, surrendering to him, and so he's beseeching, he's pleading with us. So in view of his great mercies, we do this. Now, sometimes I found a great definition of commitment. I took the points out of that, and I want to give those this morning. First of all, commitment is what transforms the promise into reality. Secondly, it is the words that speak boldly of our or your intentions. Thirdly, it is the actions which speak louder than words. Fourthly, it is the triumph of integrity over skepticism. Fifthly, it is making the time when there is none. How many of you ever said, I don't have time? Okay. Next, it's coming through time after time. You're reliable, faithful. It's the stuff character is made of, and it is the power to change. You cannot change without commitment. That's why believers I've known for 50 years today are the same place they were 50 years ago. There's no real commitment as of choice. So the importance of that. The second thing, let's go on here, verse 2. Verse 2, he says this. Stop imitating the ideas and opinions of the culture around you. Oh, or as other translations say, do not be conformed to this world. Stop imitating the ideas and opinions of the culture. How many see that so prevalent in the church today? In so many believers today? We see this imitating the culture and the world around them. We're to be in but not of, he says. And so the challenge for every generation, listen to me, generations, the challenge for every generation is how do we remain uh, 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 culturally relevant without becoming culturally compromised? And therein lies a great tension. And that's why we must always rely on his word and his spirit. Stop imitating the ideas and opinions of the culture around you, but be inwardly transformed by the Holy Spirit through a total reformation of how you think. This will empower you to discern God's will as you live a beautiful life, satisfying and perfect in his eyes. Becoming the best you. Becoming the best you. And do not be conformed to this world, but be ye transformed by the renewing of your mind that you might prove what is the good, acceptable, and perfect will of God. Transform. You see, once you commit, God will commit. Now, let me say this word, as, as I've shared this and all the same verb about being filled with the Spirit, I talk about this over and over again because it's very important to get. How do I become transformed? How many of you know the, you know the story of the caterpillar and the butterfly, right? Is the butterfly a different creature than the caterpillar? No. No. The word transform, their metamorphosis, he just went through a metamorphosis. The DNA was all inside.
Our spiritual DNA is perfect. It's allowing it to come out, become visible, is what it's about. And so that caterpillar goes in that cocoon and comes out a butterfly, looking totally different. And as we allow that spiritual DNA to have its place in us, its perfect DNA, and we allow it to have its place, then we are transformed through that process. So, do not be conformed to this world, but be transformed by the renewing of your mind. As I've said before, that verb in the Greek is, is a, c- a command. It's a command. It's in the present, meaning now. Let's do it now. But it's in the passive voice in the Greek. And I've shared over and over again. I want to share it again. The passive voice. I was hit by the ball. I, the subject, wasn't the one taking the action. I was passive in it. Active voice, I hit the ball. Here the Greek is in the passive voice. He commands you to do it, but you can't do it. So how do we get transformed? We get transformed by the spiritual disciplines. The purpose of prayer, the word, all those things, seeking the spirit and all those things are put us in his presence and in his presence he does all the work. Can I get an amen? amen? What we have to do is be disciplined in going into his presence. Can I get another amen? Here this whole thing, here character. First we looked at commitment, now we're looking at character. Right here is Paul is speaking about that. And then he goes on to say this. He goes on to say this, we're on go to verse uh, 3. God has given me grace to speak a warning about pride. I would ask each of you to be emptied of self-promotion and not create a false image of your importance. Instead, honestly assess your worth by using your God-given faith as a standard of measurement. And then you will see your true value with an appropriate self-esteem. In other words, we don't boast about those things. Pride can ruin us. So Paul is focusing on character right now, how we should walk this out and what we should do. The importance of that. You know, there's another side of that, and we'll look at that when we talk about calling. But I want us to understand something about this spiritual DNA inside of us and give you scripture so that you know it's true. Colossians 127 says that it's Christ in us, the hope of glory. So Ethan, when I look at you, it's Christ in you. It's Christ in you. Greg, it's Christ in you. It's not us. It's nothing we can boast about in ourself. But we need to place ourselves in his presence where he can do the work. What happens with so many Christians, they become religious rules and regulations. And it looks like they've mastered the disciplines. They pray a lot. They read the word a lot and everything else. But what they've done is mastered the mechanics of the discipline and not the discipline itself. Does that make sense to you? We get into the presence of the Lord and allow this metamorphosis to take place in our life. Now I want to Start reading in verse 3 of Romans chapter 12. We read that verse. God who has given me grace to speak. Now, what did God give Paul? What was that word? Grace. Charis. Charis. That Greek word, it comes from the root word Cairo, like the capital of Egypt, Cairo. And the root word literally means cheerfulness or happiness. In other words, it's God's full of joy to give us these things. And the word charis speaks of different things, favor, gratitude, gift. And in its plural, charis is charismata. What do we call churches that often emphasize the gifts? Charismatic churches. That's where we get that term from. And so Paul's speaking. Now, why is it so important? Notice what he says. God has given me grace to speak to you. Paul said in 1 Corinthians 15, 10, I want us to get this over and over again. I am what I am or who I am. Our I am is based on his grace. You know, one of the things that saddens me often is I appreciate understanding when we use the word charis in the Greek to speak of gift, that we say a gift is, 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 is not something you work for. 
And so we call grace unmerited favor. Well, that does it a disservice. It robs, us, it robs it of its richness because it means so many other things. That's only one aspect of it. But when it speaks of gratitude, thanksgiving, or, or favor, or whatever, or gifts here, in, in this sense, Paul is speaking about it was God's grace that literally identified him, made him who he was in Christ. And it will be the same with you. So we've got to unwrap that, decode our DNA, if you will, and find out what that grace of God is in each and every one of us because it varies from person to person. And that's why discipleship is so important. Commitment. Because as we go on this journey, we'll have things in breakfast disciples. We may have workshops or other things going on. We, but important also, one-on-one, -on -one working with people so that we can bring out the grace of God in their life and help them understand who they fully are and see the church building itself up in love. And boy, do we need it in this day. So it goes on. I would ask each of you to be emptied of self-promotion and not create a false image of your importance. Instead, honestly assess your worth by using your God-given faith as a standard of measurement, and then you will see your true value with an appropriate self-esteem. In the human body, now he often uses the human body as an illustration. In the human body, there are many parts and organs, each with a unique function. Now, we've got a body, but notice we have different members of the body. We have the body of Christ, but we have different members of the body. And so that's what Paul speaks about. You are a particular member in the body individually. What member are you? And one of the things that's, that, 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 that's a shame today, many people think they can be uh, 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 stay away from, if you will, the assembly of believers. You can't. Church literally means a physical assemblage of believers. And if I cut my finger off and put it over there, it's not going to survive. We need to be attached to the body of Christ. Amen? Amen, Ron. So he goes on and uses the body. In the human body, there are many parts and organs, each with a unique function, and so it is with the body of Christ. For though we are many... We've all been mingled into one body in Christ. This means we are all vitally joined to one another. Look, somebody, we're joined to each other according to the word of God. We need each other with each contributing to the others. What's your contribution to the others around you? Is it just sitting in a seat? God has far more for you than that. And the discovery of the importance of that. So important. And then he goes on to say in verse 6, God's marvelous grace imparts to each one of us varying gifts. So if God has given you the grace gift of prophecy, activate your gift by using the portion of faith you have to prophesy. And he goes on to talk, if your grace gift is serving, then thrive in serving. Now I want to talk about the third principle, key, calling. And that's where we're at right now. You're calling in the Lord. Paul says in Ephesians 4, 1, to walk worthy of your calling, your vocation. And so we want to help everybody walk worthy of that in a way that's going to glorify the Lord. So in looking at calling as we go of this, I want you to notice something as we go through here. He talks about all the, and he uses the term, and I like it, grace it's teaching, serving, whether it's prophesy, uh, whether it's leadership, all these different gifts. And then we go over to 1 Corinthians chapter 12, and I want you to go there with me. 1 Corinthians chapter 12. Please. 1 chapter 12. He begins in verse 1, My fellow believers, I don't want you to be confused about spiritual realities. Or, as he says, I don't want you to be ignorant of spiritual gifts. How many of you can honestly say you know the grace of God in you and the spiritual gifts that he gives you? How many can honestly say you know all, the, all that, have it all unwrapped? All the, unwrapped. All the way unwrapped. <laughs> it's a process. And God's designed it such that just, I mean, I can't do it by myself. I need my brother. He needs me. He designed it that way because he says in Ephesians 4, 16, according to every member doing its work, we build each other up in love. We complete each other in love. 
And so those different gifts contribute to one another. He's a great teacher. And so we see these things and how we need them in the body of Christ. And the reason this is so important, I believe, in the day we're living in, because the body of Christ is going to have to stand up and be strong. It's going to need to be functioning on all cylinders. In other words, all gifts. So that we are built up and so that we walk out there, whether we begin to read somebody's mail in the restaurant or wherever you're at because of that gift of prophecy within you or word of knowledge or whatever it is, and all of a sudden you begin breaking down and weeping and giving your heart to the Lord. We are in a battle, church. We are in a warfare. We are soldiers of God's army. He's given us all authority. So we need to step up into that. And so this whole process, now I, in 1 Corinthians chapter 12, he talks about that. Now I want to go to, in, in chapter 12, verse 11. And I love the way it brings it out here. In this translation, verse 11, he says, Remember, it is the same Holy Spirit who distributes, activates, and operates the different gifts as he chooses for each believer. You do not choose your gifts. Your parents, your school teachers do not define you. You don't define you. The Holy Spirit defines you. As God distributes them, because we have this idea that we've been raised, you can be anything you want to be. No, you can't. You need to discover your I am. You need to discover what God's called you to and your why, why he chose you. You need to understand that. See, that's false. And so we set out in life, trying, and I watch kids going into college, and, and I just dealing with one here just, just last Friday that's enrolling in our Bible college and seminary. And, and he's all these credits he had and different changing things all the time and still doesn't know what he's called to do. Wasted all that money. That's a shame. No. And so we need to help our youth as they come up, grow up, understand their I am in God so that they can set out on a journey and a pathway that's going to be worshipful to God. Well, that was worthy of an amen. So as we look at this, now, when we continue in, 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 in chapter 12 of, of 1 Corinthians, and I'm sure we'll be revisiting this, but I want you to look in a verse, uh, let me see here, eight, 14. Verse 14, in fact, the human body is not one single part, but rather many parts mingled into one. So if the foot were to say, since I'm not a hand, I'm not a part of the body, it's forgetting that it's still a vital part of the body. Some of us have an inferior complex. That is a false humility. It is of the devil. It is not of God. An inferior complex. Now, so we need to understand. As a matter of fact, he says those parts of the body, take the liver. How many see the liver? You don't see it. How important is it? Very important. It's life and death. So he says those members that seem to be less honorable, God has bestowed even more abundant honor. You see us up here, different ones of us sharing the word. But what about those with the gift of serving and helps? I believe God's going to bestow more abundant honor on those gifts. They tend to be hidden and doing many things behind the scenes. And then we come down to verse uh, what verse is it? Uh, I, I got everything marked up here, so I mark out the numbers. Verse 21, I think it is. Yes, verse 21. It would be wrong for the eye to say to the hand, I don't need you. And equally wrong if the head said to the foot, I don't need you. In fact, the weaker our parts, the more vital and essential they are. So inferiority is wrong, superiority is wrong. We've got to have a wholesome understanding of who we are in the Lord. I want... Get ready. If, if anybody has anything to write down as far as something the Lord has given them, because we're going to be winding down here in closing here in the next minute or two. So those who are going to lead us in worship, come up and get ready for that. And uh, if anybody has a word of prophecy or a uh, um, um, word of knowledge or word of uh, wisdom or anything like that, I'll be ready to have you raise your hand here in just a minute.
But I want to bring us down to the close here. Becoming the best you. Know who you are. Accept who you are. And be who you are in Christ Jesus. Unwrap. God gave us a very valuable gift and gifts. I want us to be in the process of unwrapping. Even as Lazarus, who was raised from the dead, needed to help unwrapping the grave clothes. We need help in unwrapping those things. The greatest gift you can give God is the best you, the you he created you to be. That's the greatest gift you can give back to him. And I say this over and over again, your potential will never excel or exceed the revelation of who you are in Christ. Revelation of who you are in Christ. Abba, Father. Abba, Father. I just pray for a breakout of your Holy Spirit in your church, Lord. An increase of the manifestation of your Spirit, Lord. Does anyone here have a word of knowledge? Mike, he's going to come with you with the microphone because I want everybody to hear. Earlier in the week, on the theme of I am, the Lord began to speak to me about two I ams, um, love and the truth. So he began to tell me that... Um, Fear uh, can bring us into um, fear can bring us into bondage, and um, it's like a poison. Okay, but love is the antidote. Amen. Because the word says that perfect love casts out all fear, and therefore. We know the word says God is love. So we can then say God says I am love. And you know, but the thing about that is, is that Ron said that we have to be the copy, per, the perfect copy of the perfect one. So that means that we have to be perfect love. The, the second thing he was telling me is about uh, um, lies and deceit bring us into bondage or bring us into prison. But the word says that the truth will set us free. The word says that God is truth. Jesus said, I am the truth. So once again, to be, we have to be the perfect copy of the truth. And so God is truth. We have to be truth. And I just felt that we may be at a crossroads where right now that perfect love and perfect truth is what the world needs from us. How we do that, I, Lord hasn't shown me everything, but I, I want to I learn what them two things are. How do we get there? How do we become perfect love and perfect truth and be the perfect image or the copy like Ron said of our Heavenly Father. Amen. Anybody else have something? Over here, Martha. Well, this concerns is a calling. When I was in high school, I was in a class play and uh, after the class play, I came out from behind the curtains and I went into the hallway. Now, I was... Um, like a junior in high school. And, you know, I didn't really know the voice of God or anything, but in one instant, it was like the Lord said I was going to be a mother. He, that was my calling, was to be a mother. And I should have said this last Sunday on Mother's Day, but we don't realize, ladies, that that is a calling from God to be a mother and how precious it is. And I cried in the hall. And I didn't even have a boyfriend at that time. It was a good thing if I would have told my mother she would have died. <laughs> You're going to be a mother. 
But the Lord brought it to pass, and when I was 21, I married. And shortly after that, the first one was born, and then the second one. And last week, I had the most wonderful Mother's Day. Both of my boys have moved out of state. They both came home with their girlfriend and wives, and it was absolutely wonderful. And I give all the glory to God. And ladies, if God calls you to be a mother, don't say no. Amen. Anybody else before we? Okay, over here, Justice. I just want to, um, alongside what my brother has taught us today, to, to add this word that in commitment, character, and calling, there is something alongside it called persistence, perseverance, resiliency. You cannot be one thing with this year and something different next year. Or just hang out there for five years and then later you are something else. It's not a temporary calling. This is eternal. Amen. You need to persevere there. That's why Jesus said when he comes, he winds up, he winds up finds us standing. Amen? Amen. Resilience, persistence, perseverance, endurance, whatever you go through, fix your eyes. I think the writer of Hebrews chapter 12 had this in mind when he said fixing your eyes on Jesus. Because he knew something was going to come and try to knock off, to knock you off from your calling, character and commitment. Something was going to come and disturb that. And he said fix your eyes on Jesus. Amen. Amen. Let's persevere, endure, persist, be resilient. It's through faith and patience that you hear the promises. Would you stand with me, please? First thing I want us to confess is, say with me, I am a living sacrifice, holy and acceptable unto God. Say, I am a child of the King. I will be conformed to his image and not the image of this world. Say with me, I am the righteousness of God in Christ Jesus. I want you to know your I want you to discover your individual and understand your particular member, your grace and gift he is. As we close this morning, we're going to close with a worship song and then we'll be free to go.
God in adoration. We thank you for your word this morning that is true and alive and well. We thank you for your heart to proceed moving forward in your creation to represent your kingdom and your nature on this earth. We thank you, Lord, that the only availability that will be manifested is by your Holy Spirit alone. Thank you, Lord, for showing us what we are called to do and who we are meant to be in you. Lord, we just thank you for this beautiful day. We thank you for your sun rays, your breeze, your people, your whole creation. Thank you for the Cruz clan to help us in worship. We praise you, Lord, for them. Such a blessing you are. Such a blessing you all are. You are released in the mighty name of Jesus Christ. Have a blessed and awesome day.